guys just take your seat? Everybody calm down? Yeah. All right. Uh, hi. Welcome to CS50 Week 2, Lecture 2. Today, we're actually going to be going back into the text-based programming language, which we started yesterday, called C. But before we actually go on to some, uh, some programming, just some announcements. Number one, the lecture from yesterday uh, is actually currently uploading. We tried to upload it last night, but the whole thing crashed, so we're, we're doing it right now. Uh, number two, I actually posted a video last night on our CS50 Facebook group of how to sign into C9, how to make your account. So you guys can just watch that if you want to know how to get on C9, which I'm about to show you uh, now. So, yesterday, we transitioned from a blocky language called Scratch into C. And we ran this program, hello.c. And this should look very familiar to you by now. And actually, what I'm going to do is today, I'm going to make a new folder um, called, let's say, demo. Just to mess around with it. And these commands, you guys will become familiar with these Linux commands of making a directory and changing the directory. I'm doing this on purpose just, to, uh, just, just so that you guys can get a feel for it. And if I actually do that now, I'm within this directory, inside the directory called demo. And if I create a new file, let me get rid of this, um, and I'll run, yes, I'll create a file called, I'll uh, save this, as string.c as the first demo. So, let's just uh, copy and paste over this familiar piece of code to begin with and build on top of this. So, what we want to try to do today is try to make this a piece of code a bit more interesting. You know, right now as it is, the words hello world are hard coded into it and there's no dynamism. You know, if we run this program a hundred times, we're going we're to get the same output each time and it's not really doing much. And if you guys remember in Scratch, we made some really, really cool games with really insane logic in it. But now, you know, we're just making a program that prints out the word hello world. So how can we make this a little bit more interesting? Well, how about we try to get, uh, we try to get some input from the user so we can have some dynamism. So, and we can print out hello and then whatever the user inputs. So let's see how we would try to implement that in C. So the first thing that you'd have to do is gain the input somehow. And there is a function uh, which you guys will become very familiar with called get string that you can use. And it literally prompts the user for a string. It gets a string. And if we do run this right now, it will get a string, but it doesn't save it anyway. We can't uh, reference that string in any way. So what we're going to try to do now is actually assign this, uh, the input that the user gives us into a variable. And we're going to name that variable, uh, let's say name. Uh, and it turns out in C, when, whenever you declare a variable, you need to first write the type of the variable. It's going to be a string. And then the name of the variable. And then use the equals operator to, ass uh, to, to assign the value of get string into name. And now this looks pretty cool, and of course right now it's quite redundant because it's just going to print hello world. We need, we need to print the actual name. And there's actually a cool way to do that as well. So what we can do is do something called a placeholder. Uh, and that's, where we can, that's how we can actually insert a variable into it. The thing right now is we have a, a variable called name. So if you just write hello name, what that's going to do is literally print out the words hello name. And we want it to print out whatever stored in the variable called name instead of the literal string name itself. So it turns out what we can do is use a percent %s, which is a placeholder for a string. And once the string ends, we can put in a comma and write down the name of our variable, which we want to store into it. So guys, this looks pretty cool, right? So let's try to run it and see what happens. And just a little bit of um, flashbacks from yesterday's uh, lecture of making. We're actually compiling it right now, compiling a file called, uh, what is it called, string.c. And it runs clang. Oh, we got some errors. Let's have a look. It turns out I've got tons of errors. I'm a terrible programmer. The first thing you should ever do if, when you get errors is actually go to the very, very top and look at the first error that you get. This is good advice when you're using C especially. Uh, because it could be just a very simple error in the beginning, which kind of cascades downwards. And you end up getting tons of errors just because of that one simple problem. So let's read it, see what we get. Use of undeclared identifier string. Did you mean standard in? Now, Clang is trying to correct me by saying, did you mean standard in? I actually didn't, so in this case, it wasn't very helpful. But this line over here is very helpful to me. Use of undeclared identifier called a string. Turns out in C, um, the data type called a string doesn't actually exist. And we are going to get onto the reasons why later on down the course. Uh, but for now, we need to know that a string doesn't exist in C. So what the people at Harvard have done to make life easier for us is implemented, implemented something called a library where they define a data type called C. And what a library is, uh, we've actually already got one, it's called standard io.h. 
It basically is another file within the CS50 ID somewhere uh, with a bunch of code that people at Harvard wrote in it, or not a standard IO people uh, a long time ago wrote within it. And we're actually just linking our file with the separate file with a bunch of codes there. So turns out this printf function is actually implemented within the standard IO library. So if we didn't include this library, this printf would be completely meaningless. In that very same, uh, in that very same way, if we include the CS50 library, which is called CS50.h, we can now have a data type called a string, and now we can, this program hopefully should run fine. So let's see if it will compile. Uh, instead of typing out the whole thing, I can also click just the up arrow to look at my previous command. And now nothing happens, so that should be good. And now let's run the program. Uh, dot slash string. Hmm, what happened there? It seems like the program kind of got stuck somewhere because whenever a program ends or terminates, we, we end up getting this workspace uh, demo, this directory back, but we didn't, we're just kind of stuck somewhere. Does anybody have any idea what's happening right now? Uh, Satsadru? Yeah, it's asking for the, it's asking for you to specify what name is. Yes, it's asking you, so it's prompting you for your name because of get string, that's really good. Um, so let's try putting in a name here, let's like type Ojun, see what happens. Hello Ojun. That's cool. Now we have some kind of dynamism into our program. So if I run this again and put in, um, let's say, Bob. Hello, Bob. So now we know uh, how to kind of make our program a little bit more interesting. But right now, for the user, if I gave this program or ran it for someone, um, for someone else who hasn't written it or hasn't seen the source code, they get kind of confused because when I run it, they're just prompted, if this loads, with, with just an empty line. So if I just, if I can change this um, somehow to kind of prompt the user for their name so that the user knows how, so, so, this, so that the user knows what they're expected to input to improve the user experience or the UX uh, to be short. So what we could actually do, turns out, is just print out another line prompting the user for, for their name. So it could be like name. And notice how I'm not gonna put the new line here because, and you'll see why, I don't really want to print a new line uh, and you'll see why as a sec. So let's save that, first of all, saving. Recompile that. Um, crap. Make string. Huh. Oh, I got a bug there. There we go. Same bug as Murtaza yesterday. Make. It should go well. Run program. Now it actually prompts you for your name. So if I handed this program to someone else who hasn't read the source code, they know that they're expected to input a name. So I could put in Murtaza and hello. Mortada, that works perfectly well. And if I could just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's some really cool stuff there. Now we have a program that not only gains input from the user, but also prompts the user for what type of input they want. So we've done something with strings, that's really cool. But now let's try using another data type. Um, and we can name this file int.c because we are gonna be messing around with integers. So put it in demo. And notice how I'm putting it in the demo workspace because within my terminal, I'm actually, with it, I'm actually inside the demo directory. And if you guys remember, I can change directory. If I wanna go back a step into workspace, that's how I do that. If I wanna go back into demo, it's just as simple as that. So int.c, what do I wanna do? Well, let's kind of build on from what we've done over here, very similarly, uh, and simplify it a little bit. Let's say we wanna print out hello and then some random integer. So instead of a string, I'm going to have to specify an int. I'm gonna call this variable i, which is short for int, and I'm gonna use get int, because I wanna get an int, right? Um, and now, if I run, oh, I need to change the variable name here, and this is kind of exactly the same as what I use for a string. So hopefully it works, we'll see what actually happens. So if I make uh, int, hmm, let's see what it says here. Um, uh, what's that, C, uh, line six, character 26, that's where we need to go, it's actually pointed it to us. So, it turns out there's some kind of error within this percent S over here, and it's suggesting we change it to a percent T. Well, if you guys remember when I, in, when I wrote this program, I said that a percent S is a placeholder specifically for a string, the S stands for string. And when we're, in this program, we're using integers, so we can't actually have this percent S Instead, we need to change it to a placeholder for an integer. And we, we actually can use percent %d, that would be perfectly fine, stands for decimal number. But I'm gonna use percent %i, stands for integer, they do exactly the same thing. 
but I just prefer the letter I. So let's hope that this runs smoothly. If I go down, make it int, there we go, and let's try to run it. Uh, int. Prompting for a number, 99, hello 99. And once again, if I wanted to improve the user experience, I could prompt them by printing out a line like uh, number with a semicolon at the end, make, run it, number, so random number, and hello, whatever number. And notice that because I'm specifically getting an int, if when I was prompted, oh, it's already up to date, if I was prompted and I wrote a name or a string by, if I can type, if I wrote a string here, it would actually tell me to retry because the input that I put in is not, is not an int, but it's specifying it needs an integer, and it is getting an integer over here. So if I retry and put in just you know, some random things that aren't an integer, it's gonna tell me to keep retrying, and if I eventually put in an integer, it will work. Now, right now we have a pretty interesting program. It's a lot more interesting than the Hello World program, which we used yesterday. But even right now, you know, we've only got one variable. It's still looking a little bit, you know, not that interesting. So let's add some more meat to this by adding maybe a secondary variable. Um, so we're going to use, we're going to make a program called ints, so we can have more than one variable to mess around with. Uh, and I'm going to once again, I'm just going to copy and paste it because it's redundant to type out all of this code again and the main function. Um, but let's try to get rid of this. And what we want to, I'm going to get rid of all of this actually. What we want to try to do in this program here, actually, uh, this was bad for me. I'm going to make this adder.c um, and delete this int. I'll get to that later. Adder.c, what we want to do is get two numbers from the user and add those two numbers together and print out the added value. Seems pretty simple, and we do have the tools to do it because now we know how to gain input from the user, so let's go and just do it. Oh, and by the way, guys, just one thing. In some of the PowerPoint slides, you would have seen this written like this uh, with the code um, written in here. Uh, and I and me and Murtaza actually prefer to do it like this. They functionally do exactly the same thing, it's just a design option. So if you prefer the look of this, you can do that. If you prefer the look of that, you can do that. Harvard prefers to do it that way. Uh, me and Murtaza, I know, we prefer to do it this way. It's your choice. Functionally, it makes no difference at all. So, I said we want to get two inputs, so let's go and do that. We, we want to first prompt the user, print f, and say, um, let's call these two numbers x and y, let's say. So x is, and leave a space. Actually, I won't leave a space, so you can see what that will do. Uh, and we want to get an int, int x equals, get an int, that's wrong. Oh. Wow. There we go. And I'm just going to copy and paste this actually. Nope, just to make my life a bit easier. Change that to Y. Change that to Y. I'm getting two ints. So let's just make sure that works first of all. So save that. Make adder. Oh, what did I get there? Two errors generated. Always look at. Oh, right. Let's not actually run it because whenever you declare a variable in C, you have to use it somewhere. I haven't done that yet. So actually, I am stupid. Let's try to actually print out the sum of these numbers now. So what we could do is let's say, huh, what if, oh wait, first of all, actually, this is the output that I want. Um, the sum, if I can type, of x, or I can actually put in a placeholder for an integer to print out the actual value of x, and y is, I'm not y, <laughs> integer is another integer. And I would have to specify uh, the first one, I want it to be x. second one, I want it to be y. And the third integer, I want it to be the sum of x and y. So how could I go about doing this? Well, actually, I'm going to show you and kind of mess around with it, but thanks for your um, engagement. <laughs> what I could try to do is actually make a new variable. Let's call it z, let's say. And we can just simply add x, well, x plus y. So we have a new variable, which is the sum of x and y. And let's try just printing out z over here, and it is an integer, we've got the percent i, integer z, so hopefully, if I put the semicolon here, and a semicolon here, it's put it at the end of each kind of thought, if you will, at the end of each line. Hopefully, when I make this now, make, what is it called, adder, it worked, now let's try to run it, x is, hmm, seems like we've got 
some kind of bug here. Of course, we can write a number. There's nothing wrong with the function of the program, but in terms of the aesthetics, if I enter a number here, it just says kind of x is 10. There's no, there's no space there, and I want, I want there to be a space. So I'm just going to get out of this program by, by clicking Control c which is uh, completely exits the program. And look at what I've done here. You know, previously I said, I actually said, I'm going to put a space here, and then I backtrack on that. It turns out, if we wanted to have a space in there, we literally have to tell the computer to put the space in there, because the computer literally does what, it tell, what we tell it to do. So let's try recompiling this and rerunning this. Hopefully it should work. There we go, now we have a nice space there. So let's see, x is 10, I mean x is 1, y is 10, and it should, be, should say the sum of 1 and 10 is 11. And you've actually got another bug here, which I didn't intend to do, but I think we solved with a new line over there. Um, and functionally, this program, if I, this is actually bugging me, uh, so if I just put a 1 and 10 again, there we go. I didn't recompile it. <laughs> so you have to recompile it every time you make a change. Good lesson there to learn. Hopefully, there we go. So functionally speaking, this program has no issues at all. It has 1 and 10, and we know that the answer 11 is correct. That's all good. But if you actually look at our program, we've actually declared a new variable called z, and we've used it immediately afterwards and never used it again. And functionally speaking, that's fine. But just uh, for good design practice, I mean, for just for good programming practice, it's not that good to just declare a variable, use it immediately afterwards, and never use it again. So what we can actually do, instead of making a whole new variable and using up more spaces in memory, we could just type in x plus y over here. And that should do exactly the same thing. So remember to recompile your code every time you make a change. You run the code again, 1, 10. So functionally, that still works fine. But now we've actually made our code one line shorter, and it just looks nicer to look at. And it's just better practice overall. So now we've got a pretty interesting program. We can add two numbers together. Uh, but what if we wanted to perform other mathematical operations on it, just to make life a little bit more interesting? So what I'm going to do now is exactly that, ints.c. And what we want to do is add two numbers, subtract two numbers, multiply two numbers, uh, uh, divide two numbers, and find out the remainder of two numbers. So let's build on from what we've got over here. Fix it over there. Actually, I need to get to the library as well. There we go. And uh, we don't want to just get the sum. So what we could do, I'm just going to get that. One, two, three, four. So we want to get the, uh, the sum of that and that. OK. I'm just going to rephrase this, actually. That minus that is this. Uh, that plus that is this. Actually, just, OK. This is going to take some time. Multiply by that is that. If I divide this over here by, and I'll see the remainder, oh, the remainder of i and i is that. OK, and obviously I need to change all of these arguments, or not these arguments, I need to change all these values over here. So x minus y would be x minus y. x multiplied by y, the multiplication is, operator is actually this, um, the star. And the division is just a, uh, a slash like that. So we've got that the remainder is actually something that you may not have seen. I know some of you have actually seen it during your scratch projects, but it's the percent sign, which is a bit confusing. Because if you guys remember, if you're within a string, the percent sign means we're going to make a placeholder. But when you're outside of a string, the percent means a modulo. It's a mathematical operator, which gets the remainder of two numbers. So we're actually going to do a demo here, so you can kind of get a feel for what that is. So hopefully, that should work absolutely fine. So let's just make ints. No errors, that's good. And I'll run ints. I'm going to put in 1 and 10 once again. So 1 plus 10 is 11. That's good. 1 minus 10 is minus 9. 1 multiplied by 10 is 10. 1 divided by 10 is 0. That's a little bit interesting. I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. But just for the sake of the modulo operator, one, the remainder of 1 uh, and 10 is 1, which is correct. You do 1 divided by 10, you get 0, remainder 1. And if I can just use some nicer numbers to demonstrate that again, um, if I, let's say, do 7 divided by 4, I should get a remainder of 3. Because, you know, 4 goes into 7 once, and you have 3 remaining. So that's what the modulo operator does. But let's take a look at this line more specifically. 
what is actually happening here? Because we know 7 divided by 4 isn't a 1, right? It's 1 and a little bit more. Um, so, turns out in C, when you, when you create a, a, a variable type called an int, it's only an int. And an integer, by, by mathematical definition, is something, uh, is a whole number. So it has no decimals or, or, no, or nothing after the decimal point. So 1, 3, 5, 7, those would be integers. 5.1, 5.6, 27.1, those would not be classified as integers. So in C, you have to be very explicit about the variable type that you want. And does anybody know what I could change this variable type to to fix this problem here? Arno? A float. A float, yes. A float stands for floating point number. And the reason it gets that name is if you go and, uh, go and study binary a little bit in depth, uh, what, what it basically does is the point, the decimal point, kind of floats about, which allows you to use uh, numbers with decimal points. That's just a very simplified version of it. But just know that floating point numbers can represent numbers such as 5.2 or 7.6, which has numbers after the decimal point. So let's try to do that with a new program. I'm going to call this floats. Oh, save this as floats.c within demo. Save, there we go. And we're just going to build on from what we've done over here. Uh, there we go. Yes, and we're, instead of getting integers as inputs, we're going to get a float as an input. Same over here, we're going to get float as an input, and of course I need to change the function to get float instead of get int over here. Oh. And it turns out, once again, the placeholders have to be changed. When it's, when it's an integer, and uh, when it's a string, it's percent %s. When it's an integer, it's percent %i. When it's a float, we use percent %f. So I'm just going to go change all of those over here. Multiply by float. should give us the correct answers. So, we've got to compile the program once again to get from source code to machine code. This is called floats. Floats. Huh. We got an error in line 15, uh, character 58, and it actually points to us. The modulo operator seems to be having some issues over here, and it turns out something else that we need to learn is that we actually can't use the modulo operators, well, the modulo operator with two floating point numbers because Whenever a computer gets a floating point number, it will try to get the precise value of, of the division instead of rounding it to the nearest integer and giving you a remainder. So the modulo operator only works with integers. So I'm actually just going to get rid of that line just because we want to see if the division works. That's the main purpose of this program. So hopefully, if I recompile this, no issues there. And if I try to run it, put in the numbers 1 and 10. We know that 1 divided by 10 is 0 0.1. Fingers crossed. Plus one is eleven. We get all these decimal points, uh, which we will worry about uh, later. Just to get, we're just going to see for now if the numbers themselves are correct. Plus eleven, good. Minus minus nine. Multiply this ten, divide it, and we actually do get the correct number here. So we're very happy with that. And now we know that when we're using numbers uh, that are integers, we use the data type int. If we're using numbers that have numbers after the decimal point, such as zero point one, we have to use a data type float. But now, we have all these little zeros afterwards, which are really annoying, and we want to get rid of them. We just want this to look cleaner, so that the, so that the output is actually a lot more readable to a person. Turns out, C has implemented a way that we could actually do that. So what we could do is, within the placeholder itself, we could specify how many digits after the decimal point we want to print out. So we could do, let's say, uh, and for 1 plus 10, for all of these actually, we, don't, we actually don't need any of the decimal points. So I'm just going to say point zero say that zero digits after the decimal point, which basically means nothing after the decimal point. And actually, this could be shortened to just a point, but just to help with your understanding, I'm going to do point zero over here and put them all here like so. Uh, here, right? And now for the actual output, we know 11 doesn't need any decimal points. That's fine. We know minus 9 doesn't need anything. Multiplication, 10 is fine. But we want this to print to, let's say, one decimal point. So we could just do point 0.1 over here, and that should give us the, the output that is a lot more readable to us and helps with the user experience. So if I go again and recompile the code and then rerun the code, put in 1, 
y equals 10. And now we should get the right numbers. So we do actually get the correct numbers, and it's a lot more readable than whatever we got before. So we, now we know that we can use ints, we can use strings, we can use floats, and manipulate data, and do a lot of cool things with it. Uh, but the thing is, in C, there are a lot more data types that we can mess around with. And there are a lot of interesting things that we can do with them, and a lot of interesting side effects that we will experience during our time programming. And to talk about those a little bit more in depth, I'm going to introduce Murtaza onto the stage. Right, so we've talked about floats and ints and strings in a little bit of depth. And actually in C, there's quite a few more data types that we have access to. So thanks to the CS50 library, we also have bool, which doesn't exist in C, but a boolean uh, data type is just one that's either true or false, like we talked about in previous lectures. We can have a char, short for character, which is just a single character, a single ASCII character. Uh, int, which we've seen a lot, float, which we've seen a lot, so those are uh, for integers and uh, numbers with decimal places. And we also have a long long and a double, so a long long is just, uh, a lo it's also an integer type, but it's, it's longer, literally that's why it's called long. And a double is just a double precision floating point. So long long uh, and int are both integers, float and double are both floating point numbers. And then also thanks to the CS50 library we have access to string, which allows us to store a series of characters, basically. Now, when we, when we store these data types on our computer, we store them in the RAM. When we're working with a program, all the data that the program is using gets put into RAM and it's stored there temporarily. Obviously, in our computers, we have a finite amount of RAM. In this computer in here, there isn't an infinite number of sticks of RAM. We have probably two sticks of RAM in there. So at some point, we're gonna we, we could run out of space, potentially, when we're storing data. But let's look a little more deeply into that. Let's look at these data types. And uh, I'm just gonna close all these tabs. Um, and we're gonna write a new program. So I'm gonna write it from scratch. That's in caps lock. And you'll see here that the syntax highlighting hasn't uh, worked right now. We've, we're, we're typing completely in black and white. Uh, that's because we haven't saved the file yet. Um, and in order to in order to get that syntax highlighting, we need to save it with the file extension C. That's how the text editor knows that it's highlighted in the in the uh, C syntax. So we'll call this one size of dot C. We'll make a excuse me. We'll make an int main function as we have been before. And now what we're going to try and do is find out how big each of those data types actually is. So let's start with this. Uh, let's start with making a printf statement. So we'll say that int is now I'm going to type a new placeholder here, which is lu. Don't have to worry about what that is. And we're going to use what's called the size of operator, which actually literally tells us how big a specific data type is. And uh, let's copy this a few times. Um, we'll go for long long here. We'll check floats, uh, char. I've, I've done these in a completely weird order, but that's OK. Double there. Bool and string. And now all we need to do is change the data types here. So the size of operator literally tells us how much space an integer or a long long is going to take up in the memory when we create a program that uses it. So just going through all of these and changing them to the right data type. Um, now we'll save this. We will make size of. Hopefully no errors. No rule to make tiny size. Am I in the right? It, oh, size was in the wrong directory. So we're gonna go up a directory because we made the file in the workspace directory, not in the demo directory. So we'll go up by doing cd dot dot make size of, which is in this directory, the workspace directory, not in demo. Size of seemed to make, and now we can run size of. Ooh. Here's a bug. We forgot to put new lines at the end. This is kind of unreadable. Let's quickly add those new lines. See, now at this point, you guys are going to start noticing these bugs as we type them. So you might cringe a little bit when, when we make them. But um, that's OK, because it's not a major bug. So we'll recompile again, run the program. Scroll up, uh, expand this window. 
window a bit so we can see the entire output. Right, int is 4, long long is 8, float is 4, char is 1, double is 8, bool is 1, string is 8. 8 what? Basically it's saying each of these, each of these numbers is in bytes. So as we learned a few, uh, two weeks ago or one week ago, there are 8 bits in a byte. So actually if we look at bool, in theory a boolean only needs to be 1 bit, it only needs to be 1 or 0. But it's actually 8 bytes when it's stored in C. Because the, the implementation that CS50 have done is kind of wasteful, it's, it's wasting 7 bits of data. If we look at int now, every integer is four bytes in memory. And let's expand on that a little bit. Let's go back to a program that Ojin Wright wrote. Let's go to adder.c, take a look at the source here, and just run it to remind ourselves how it works. So we take x is 5, y is 8, the sum of 5 and 8 is 13. Let's, what does this actually look like in our, um, in our RAM, in our computer? Well, basically, we can think of our memory as a massive grid of bytes. And let's say that each line, for example, has uh, five bytes. When we take int x equals get int, what the, what the program does is it finds some space in memory that's four bytes long. So let's say, let me grab another color. Let's say it picks this space in memory these four bytes that are next to each other, it'll, it'll label this as x, and then it'll store the integer in these four bytes. It's going to do the same thing with y somewhere else. They don't have to be next to each other. It could be any random place in memory. It's going to call this y and store an integer in these four bytes. And then it's going to take the value of this integer and this integer, add it together, and print it out for the user to see. So that's what's going on in our memory. And because the data types, as we showed, have different uh, sizes, this, uh, the amount of memory that they take up in your, in your RAM depends on what data type they are. Now, coming back to size of, when we, when we look at string, cl clearly we've created strings that are longer than eight characters. We, we had hello world, that's already longer than eight. So you don't have to really worry about what's actually going on here. We'll explain that later when we look more in depth at strings. But just know that it's not, string is actually not limited to eight uh, bytes in your memory. It can be as many as the length of the string that you have. So now, let's um, think about what might happen if we have an integer. Since we have a limited space for integers in our memory, what are the problems associated with this? Well, in real life, if you have your decimal point here, you have an infinite number of places to the right of the decimal point and an infinite number to the left. So you can keep counting higher and higher and higher. After billion, you can go to trillion, you can go to quadrillion, you can go to quintillion, etc. There is no actual limit to how high you can count in real life. But imagine we're in a computer. And let's say we have an 8-bit integer. These, these integers in C are 32 bits because they're 4 bytes. Let's say we have a 1-byte integer or an 8-bit integer. And we have this number, which is 254. If you want to count up by 1, that's easy. We just add 1. So this is still OK. It's 255 now. What would happen if we tried to add 1 now? This would increase by 1, so that would turn into a 1, 0. The 1 would carry, that would become a 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. In theory, there would be a 1 here, except we have a limited amount of space in our memory. So that 1 disappears. We wrap back around to 0. This is known as overflow. And let's see if we can actually get this to trigger in, uh, in C. We're going to make a new file, save it as overflow.c. This time I will put it in demo. Um, I, you know what, I'm going to copy from here. Save some time. So, what we need to try and demonstrate is that if we count too high, we'll hit an overflow error. So let's start counting. Let's um, make a loop. As we saw earlier, we can make loops by doing a while and then a condition, and that's a tour. That should be true. Uh, so, so this loop will run as long as that condition is true. And true is always true. So that, that loop is going to run forever, like the forever loops we had in Scratch. So let's do while true. Um, in fact, let's declare int i equals 0 at first so we can actually start counting somewhere. We'll say print f i is, and then a placeholder for an integer. And then we substitute in i for that. And then let's increase the value of i at the end of this loop. 
i equals i plus 1. In fact, we can actually shorten that because that's such a common operation. We could shorten it to i plus equals 1. This is known as syntactic sugar. It does exactly the same as i equals i plus 1. i plus equals 1 is exactly the same thing. Or, in fact, we can just do i plus plus because incrementing by 1 is such a common operation. So let's do that. Oops, forgot a semicolon. Let's see what happens now. Make overflow. Aha, uh -huh, we have a semicolon error. I'm sure a few of you caught that while I was writing. Dot slash overflow to run overflow. Right. Well, I also I forgot the new line. But as we can see, I is counting up uh, pretty fast. We're at about 300,000 right now. So the, the integers in C are 32 bits, which means that you can have 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, eight times here, eight ones here, eight ones here, eight ones here, before you hit an overflow error. So that's two to the power of 32, which is about four billion. We're on 600,000 right now. We're not gonna reach four billion anytime soon. So let's actually cancel this. Now I've hit control C. As we know, control C cancels the program, but it's, it's kind of laggy because the program is kind of stuck. Uh, it's throwing out so much output at you that it's not really listening for input. So instead, we're gonna ignore that and just open a new terminal so we can keep working without having to Ah, nice. That's okay then. It, it did cancel. So let's modify this. Instead of increasing by one each time, we could double each time. So, and instead of doing it infinitely, we could limit it to a certain number of times. So my terminal doesn't get filled up with 800,000 print statements. We can make a new type of loop, which is a for loop. So this is the syntax for a for loop. We'll go 64 times. And that means we don't have to have i declared, uh, i incremented there or declared here. So what a for loop does is it uh, runs this statement the first time. It checks this condition every uh, every loop or every iteration, and it does this operation every iteration. I've forgotten a bracket there. Uh, what this is going to mean is that i is going to start at zero, and it's going to stop the loop when i is greater than uh, greater than or equal to 64. Now. Instead of uh, doing i plus plus here, we're going to do i equals i times 2. One last problem here is that if i starts at 0, 0 is never going to double to anything other than 0. So we'll go for i equals 1, and we will add a new line here to make our life easier. Let's see if that runs. That did not... Uh, ah, hang on. Right. So, in this, in this case, i goes up to 64. Uh, 64 and stops. What we actually want is for this entire loop to run 64 times. So let's change the logic of that a little bit. Let's make a new variable, a new integer variable called n. And instead of printing out i and doubling i each time, because that was just a bad, that was just very bad logic, we can double n each time and increase i by 1 each time. And instead of printing out i, we can print out n. Mm -hmm. That's a Make n equals 1. So it, yeah. I'm sorry for once. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know what that sound is. What happened now? Okay, good, good, good. So as we can see, we reached about a billion pretty well. So the doubling started, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. We reached a billion, then we went to about negative 2 billion, and then we got to zero. So the overflow happened somewhere here. This is where it started go going wrong. And the reason we went to a negative number is because um, in C, by default, integers can have a sign. So actually, it doesn't go from 0 to 4 billion. It goes from negative 2 billion to positive 2 billion. But that's, um, that's another matter completely. Now, there is a way to alleviate this in C. We could um, fix this overflow error by using a different data type. So as we said, ints are four bytes long. We talked about long longs, which are eight bytes long. So that means we'll have double the amount of, uh, of uh, place values to have before overflow occurs. So let's make this a long long. Um, let's make, keep this at 64 iterations, or we can actually, yeah, 64 is fine. We'll also change the text there, which was wrong. Now, the placeholder percent i is for an integer whereas we have a long, long here. So we actually need to change this to LLU, I believe, or something like that. Recompile it. So 
now hopefully our integer container is quite a bit bigger. So we safely reached 4 billion, which seems to be the limit of a, a 4 byte integer, with this um, 8 byte integer, which can go quite high. Of course, this is still limited. We still have a limited amount of space. In this case, it's 8 bytes. We could define an integer that's 16 bytes and have even uh, e an even larger range. Like even I can show you here, if I increase the number of times this runs by a few, we'll see that we get overflow here as well. Because there's no way to fix this error other than having infinite space, which we can't. Now, let's look at some consequences of overflow in the real world. Um, there's a game called Civilization. Uh, in this game, you different um, different uh, civilizations had like certain stats about them. There was a stat for aggression. So Gandhi, his aggression stat starts at one. Now, if in Civilization you adopt democracy, your aggression stat goes down by two. So you get aggression minus 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 minus. So that basically means go down by two. So Gandhi's aggression score. Well, uh, Gandhi's aggression score was 1. It's supposed to be out of 10. They decreased it by 2, so decreasing by 1 is okay, it goes to 0. Decrease it again, it's at 255 now. We, we have an underflow, which is kind of the opposite of overflow, but it's the same idea. So Gandhi's aggression score is now 255, so he's going to be super aggressive. He's uh, uh, declaring war and saying that he will pay for your foolish pride. Uh, this is this is a consequence of underflow. The programmers of Civ didn't check whether the number went lower than zero. So this is what kind of problems you can uh, have with overflow in programming. And um, with that, I think we're going to wrap up this lecture of week two, lecture one. Obviously, zero indexed. So yesterday was lecture zero. Thank you. Batch of flashes there at the end, and I'll uh, use that slide.